this is just kind of a history of Stevens B Company. You know, when I started, how things went, and uh, some things I think that are maybe not unique to us, but are are uh, pieces of our operation that made us successful. So my first B experience, I was telling Anna a little bit ago, my first B experience uh, occurred whenever my father and my brother bought some honeybee colonies as a business venture, which they, of course, later found out it was hot, you get stung. Uh, there's a lot of work to it, and there can also be a, a minimal profit at times. But here's a picture of me, uh, a total greenhorn with a angelic white suit on there investigating my my honeybees my new obsession so once you open up a bee colony a lot of you can relate to this as it's just kind of mind-blowing in there each frame's like a page of a book it's completely unique it depends on the seasons it just really connects you with nature and like i was telling anna earlier um being in bee colonies has a therapeutic effect so if i'm feeling stress or I've had a rough day at the office, um, I can get in the bees and just kind of helps me mellow out. And so as soon as I had gotten in this beehive, I immediately started cooking up uh, plans to have my own beehives. And as I put here, addiction quickly took hold. It was just something that I was so into and I was excited by it. And so I would call it an addiction slash obsession and before long i was shelling out money to buy new equipment and buy starter colonies for expansion this beautiful lady here is my wife who has put up with my beekeeping career and has helped out for many years now and she's put up with a lot these two they're kind they're pretty helpful now but whenever they were this size, not necessarily. We would take them beekeeping with us and, you know, Jamie would keep an eye on them or keep the air running and entertain them a bit and help me where she could. But one time we were putting in new nucleus colonies and I had an arrow in my truck behind the seat somewhere. Well, the kids found it and made Swiss cheese out of the headliner of my truck and got out a two-part epoxy and somehow glued the power button on my favorite LED flashlight. So, you know, they're helpful now, but it, they definitely put a hamper on my beekeeping career whenever they were about this size here. This is some of our starter colonies. I got all new cypress beehives. Uh, people that know me know I love cypress wooden and th these are what the nukes came in at the time. So th that was probably my second or third year of beekeeping. I think that was my second year whenever I bought those 10 colonies. So my third year of beekeeping, two major concepts collided. And I think that's what put Stevens Bee Company on the trajectory it's on now is two things that happened. So uh, everybody has been who has been to a bee meeting is aware that, you know, it's like Varroa Anonymous meeting, how we talk about Varroa most of the time or managing Varroa. And <clears throat> obviously that's like a primary problem in beekeeping. And so I just started thinking about how there's, how could you address a primary problem in beekeeping? And Mom said I should be an entomologist whenever I grew up, whenever I was a little bitty. <clears throat> and so I guess I think like an entomologist. Now I'm a trained entomologist. And host resistance is the obvious answer. Like, how can the bees defend themselves? And I started obsessing over BSH <clears throat> a lot. That's why, uh, you know, the introduction where it said I constantly annoy my wife by talking about bees it's not just bees it's like 
intricate details of bees or host resistance or stuff she really doesn't want to listen to. So God bless her. I purchased Tom Glenn VSH Italian artificially inseminated breeder queens. And I also got some of the Paul Lime hygienic Italians. This is when John Harbo was at the bee lab. And between him and Tom Glenn, Tom Glenn was a master of his craft. Like I completely changed the face of my beekeeping operation because before I started using host resistant genetics, I had chalk brood, brood pattern issues, obviously mite issues, who doesn't? Um, winter survival production, all the issues you get whenever you have bees that, you know, are susceptible to chalk brood and everything else under the sun so whenever i started using these breeder queens uh that was my main weapon against all the things that kill bees is whenever i would see a wheat colony or a queen that's not doing well i would just replace the queen but i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because the same time i figured out how to raise my own high quality queens by grafting i actually put the cart before the horse and I ordered breeder queens because I was so obsessed over it. Ordered breeder queens, and then I figured out how to graft. And, of course, that didn't go well whenever I first tried it. Like, the first time, I got a big, fat goose egg. But I figured it out pretty quick and started getting some killer, high-quality queen cells. And, that, like I said, whenever I would run across a problem, I would just requeen. You know, brood diseases, getting tore up by mites, uh, a deep worm wing virus expressed. I would just replan aggressively. This is back when cameras weren't as good. And the photographer still isn't good. <laughs> but the resolution's a little bit fuzzy, but you can tell. Um, even back in the day, I, I was getting some nice looking queen cells. Especially those Glen Italians, those gigantic, beautiful queens. Some more cells of ours, those are more recent. I was telling Anna, I, I have a day job currently. I won't have one after March 1 of this year, coming up in a few weeks. I'm just going to be doing bees and bee research. But even with my day job at Nestle Purina as a senior transportation guy, even doing that, we were still able to ship a little over 2,000 virgin queens this year, and it was the worst year I've seen. So on a good year without a day job, we should be able to do substantially more than that. But quality queens, huge factor in the success of building Stevens V company and using actual stock that has resistance. Here's my incubator. Um, you can tell these are starting to emerge here. I've added attendance with those. These were probably grafted later and oftentimes I'll color code which breeder I grafted out of. So that's probably two different queen mothers. Whenever, you, after I started obsessing over host resistance traits like VSH, and there's other traits too that are beneficial to honeybees that are classed as host resistance. But I kept thinking about how queens mate with such a large number of drones. And I felt like if I was, because I really wanted to breed for those certain traits, I wanted to come up with something unique, but is very mite and disease resistant. So I started getting obsessed over instrumental insemination, over controlling the mating to some degree. Now, there's no substitute for open mating, except in trait selection. It kind of works against trait selection just because in favor of diversity, which has its benefits too. But I started investigating instrumental insemination. And whenever I would mention this, what the person that I would always hear mentioned associated with instrumental insemination was Sue Kobe. I felt she was world renowned and for a reason. Um, she had a good work and educational history and she was just always plugged in doing cool stuff. So I learned from Sue in 2014. The kids, you can see, have grown here. Now they're being set of gluing power buttons and making Swiss cheese out of my headliner. They're catching drones. So they're quite helpful nowadays. 
Here's one of my breeder queens. Another breeder queen. Whenever you put that number of disc on the back there, the price goes up exponentially. Another breeder queen. Check out our brood pattern here. You know, a lot of people will say instrumentally inseminated queens, <clears throat> you know, can't perform or they have issues. And sometimes they do. Sometimes whenever you're taking the place of Mother Nature, things don't go exactly as they should or according to plan. So some percentage of them, you know, won't be great or will have issues for some reason. But the ones that everything goes according to plan, they should last just like an open mated queen. You know, last year, a lot of ours were, you know, in double deeps with honey supers. I say last year, last year was terrible. We didn't make a ton of honey. It was the year prior. They were in double deeps with multiple honey supers on. The breeder, breeder queens I had this last year, I kept them split down into nukes. Because if you let them get really big, you know, they'll swarm just like a open mated queen too. Here's some drones we were catching. So what we'll do is we'll go into an apiary and test as many colonies as you can. As long as that queen has been in that colony for, you know, eight weeks or so. You should be able to get a good score on her workers. You know, if it's if she's been replaced, you're actually grading the workers of the queen that was there before if you jump the gun too soon. But once we get our scores, I put these little uh, queen, I, I guess it's an entrance influder maybe. I don't know what you would call it. But basically, whenever all these drones are flying off to the singles bar and then they return home, they can't get back in. And so then we have these drone cages my friend Mimi made for me with a quick release here. And I just, we add those drones to the cages and then collect later. Okay, enough about instrumental insemination. It's not, not necessary for most folks, but I feel like it is kind of part of my business model. So I, I mentioned buying Glen breeders um, for years, I pretty much just anything that I thought was VSH, I would buy it. And, you know, VSH, some people measure it differently. Some don't measure it at all. Um, I think the Harbo assay is the gold standard. He's the one, John Harbo is the one uh, that came up with SMR VSH at the B lab, him and, and, and others, Jose Bia. Uh, Jeff Harris, there were several others there, but Harbo um, came up with a scoring guide. And so he's, he's just been a, a big influence on me. The guy uh, deserves a lot of credit for all of this, really. So it's, it's great to buy that stuff, but I had instrumental insemination but I wasn't confident. I'm like, well, I'm open mating some, you know, like everybody says, how quick does it dilute? You know, how long does it take to lose it? So I didn't want to lose it. So I just kept buying breeding stock. Anybody that said they had VSH stuff, you know, I didn't know how to test it. I just bought it and just mixed it all in my population. So one of my friends mentioned that Dr. John Harbo, you know, retired USDA bee scientist was looking for breeding group participants. Like if you had instrumental insemination, that was a huge plus. And if you had anything VSH or were interested in selecting for it, you know, that was, that was it. So with the group members that he accepted, um, he shared the Harbo assay with, and I think, I don't know what year this was. I think it was, I would have to go back and look. It was the end, or end of 19. It was like before the 2020 season, I think. I think we started measuring spring of 2020. And that and whoever was in his breeding group had, you know, access to the assay and how to do it and how to score it. And I don't think outside of the B lab, um, many people were actually selecting prior to that. So after I learned how to measure it, it was like the veil came off of my eyes. Like you can, you can score it so it's measurable and maybe there's a little bit of variation, you know, and with 
seasons and whatnot. So, but overall, it's pretty innovative because before that, you couldn't really measure it. Like there was a hygiene test or freeze killed brood, you could measure that, but we knew it wasn't exactly Varroa specific. Well, this is different. Um, this is directly associated with Varroa sensitive hygiene. So that was a, a game changer, learning that from John. So VSH assays are really fun. I, I usually put that, I put that one of my other slides and I was like, yeah, I'm just kidding. It's a complete lie. They're not fun at all. But if you have uh, good friends that are uh, into bees and want to come hang out and have some fun, um, you can con your friends into coming down and, and helping do assays. Um, they can be a little bit tedious. Some people like them if you're laughing. Um, they're not nearly as tedious. So this is uh, my friend Erin Mullins on the left here. She's the uh, former state fair chair for Missouri State Beekeepers. Excellent, awesome young lady. She's a nurse. My buddy Jeff there in the back, uh, Riverbend Honey. There's me. Seems like I had a little bit more hair two years ago. And my buddy Kyle Day, he was an ambassador for Missouri State Beekeepers whenever I was uh, president, and uh, he's their conference coordinator now. So we have them out to do assays, because if you have more people helping, you get way more done, because it's rather time-consuming. Uh, this is Eugene Makovic, editor of American Bee Journal, Aaron Mullins again, Kyle, repeat repeat tester, and Will Sammons, he's up around St. Louis. I think he's on the Illinois side. Um, he's got my breeding stock back whenever I first started producing it, so he's very interested in it. You may recognize this man here from Michigan, Matthew Kobe. <clears throat> Look how calm he looks inspecting this frame. What was actually going on under the table was my spirit animal, a cat I raised that Jamie found behind my bee shop and their eyes were closed. I bottle fed them into this fine young cat that Matt named the terrorist. She's terrorizing him <laughs> while he's doing VSH assays. Some more Michigan folks. Megan, who actually loves assays, James Lee, from Michigan, myself, Matthew, look at the sweat here. You can tell we were working. They came and helped me do assays. So we knew how to measure VSH, and that changed the game to where I could actually pick from the stuff that's scoring high, and then the drones pictures that I showed there, I would collect out of the high-scoring colonies and just mix them all together and inseminate uh virgin queens that came from my previous breeders and so on and so forth we just we keep that going so ubo some people have heard of this some people haven't it's really new to the scene that's like a it's a new modernized version of a it's a type of hygiene test it stands for unhealthy brood odor instead of killing brood like a uh, freeze killed brood liquid nitrogen Instead of freeze killing brood and waiting 24 hours, you spray uh, the equivalent of stress pheromones on just a little circle of brood and then let it dry and then put them in there and two, only check back in two hours. So instead of 24 hours, this is a two hour test. It's a lot more stringent and you're looking to see if they uncap it. So as I mentioned, UBO uh, is unhealthy brood odor. Kara Wagner, who invented this technology, this is back from, she's been working on this for 12 years. So they synthesized brood pheromones um, from infested, varroa infested brood. And so this is what you're spraying on your brood to see how those bees react to varroa infested brood pheromones. So she, she had heard me say, uh, that we were breeding VSH bees and we had been selecting for VSH. And so I think maybe that's why she targeted us for trials or because she heard me say that I predicted a high overlap between VSH bees and UBO bees. And the reason I 
thought that there was going to be a high overlap is because I mentioned earlier that with the VSHBs that I'd used for years, if I saw something wrong, I would just requeen that colony. Um, when In the past, if I saw deformed wing virus, like you see a bunch of workers that have it, obviously the viral level of deformed wing virus is high in that colony. I would switch that queen out with a daughter out of a pure VSH breeder queen. You probably should treat them and requeen them. But since I'm wanted to know what they were capable of, I just switched the queen out. I didn't treat them with anything. And every single time, if that colony didn't crash, if it made it, you know, the requeen was successful and they took off again, every time I would go back a couple months later, zero bees with deformed wing virus. Every single time I would replace that queen. And so I didn't know how to articulate it or how it was working, but I knew those VSHBs somehow had some form of viral resistance. Well, Kara's UBO data said that UBOBs, type of hygiene, varroa sensitive hygiene. So we're kind of overlapping verbiage here. Now I'm seeing field and scientific data overlap. She said they have, on a colony level, much lower levels of deformed wing virus. And so I was like, there's going to be overlap, guaranteed. That was my hunch, anyway. And there was. Oh, sorry. I gave you a spoiler alert there. Here's a few pictures of us. This is me and Kara, June of last year. It's me applying UBO. This is my buddy, Jeff. Uh, like I mentioned, you got to have friends that are into this that are willing to come help out because man, you can get so much more done. So check that out there on this frame. See where it's all of those are uncapped. That's what you want to see. The bees are opening it up to see what's What's wrong? What's going on? This one, they not only removed the caps, but some of the pupa are gone, and a lot of them's heads are chewed, and they're starting to pull those out. And that one's halfway gone. And that's after two hours. So you, you spray it, let it dry, put it back in the colony, and then you open the colony up two hours later and see how they reacted. And if you look around this frame, this they uncapped because that's where the UBO was sprayed. But look over here, you can see a few, little bit of eye poking through there. Um, those, I think the caps have been messed with. And if you look at some of these, they're a lot darker in the center. I would say those were probably uncapped, recapped, which I think there's, well, if you look at the early USDA data, if they had a little sheet, there's one you can still find on the internet from Jose Villa, Harbo, and Harris. And it has a visual, like here's the first, if you see it, this could be VSH. It's the first visual indicator. And it's uncapped bird like this here. And if you just walked across it, obviously it wouldn't be in a perfect circle. But if you see bird that are uncapped, it could be VSH. But then it says further testing is needed. So I think there's some that have a low threshold of uncapped. So if they're uncapping, sometimes they're get they're completely overrun by mites. You know, if you're seeing uncapping in a VSH colony, it's usually uh, they're not being overrun. They're being hyper focused on it typically. So I mentioned earlier that I predicted there was a substantial overlap with VSH or SMR. I think if you're doing a VSH Harbo VSH assay you're technically measuring suppressed mite re reproduction. And that's actually what they called VSH, varroa sensitive hygiene. Before they called it VSH, they called it suppressed mite reproduction. So I predicted the overlap would be substantial. And according to Kara, there's statistically significant positive correlation between UBO and VSH scores based off of testing at our place. And Steve, she said Stevens B Company's UBO scores were unprecedented, and she had tested in, I think, seven different countries at that time, including the United States. So if I had to summarize, you know, what's, what's the, in the secret sauce? Um, probably 
first and foremost, great friends and family that are willing to help out because, you know, any of you that have gotten into beekeeping know that there's a lot of work to it. I mean, it's manual labor. Um, people have to love you to come and do manual labor with you. So if you don't have a support network of people and friends that are into bees that, that love you and love the bees, you know, it's hard to, hard to get started just doing it yourself. I think part of it's refusing to quit. I put whenever it makes sense because, man, this is probably any agricultural venture, especially beekeeping. Um, it can be really trying at times, you know, especially after year three, when you think you have it figured out, got everything figured out and then you get side swiped and, you know, you lose bees or something unexpected happens that shakes <laughs> your faith and your understanding. Um, I think you have to be able to power through that. Um, one of my beekeeping buddies that passed away, Grant Gillard, he was a former state president, awesome guy. You know, he's like, how do you stay in beekeeping? How do you keep going? You know, and he's like, it's easy. You just don't quit. <laughs> so I think refusing to quit is a good part of it. And as far as from a business perspective, as far as actually making money, like beekeeping was, we all joke about it being an expensive hobby. It was just an expensive hobby, even though I wanted it to be a lot more than that until I mastered queen rearing. And it seemed like once I mastered queen rearing, it went from expensive hobby to I actually was making a little bit of money. Like, hey, Jamie, you know, flashing my dollar bills around to the wife. What do you want to go do? Let's go hang out. <laughs> so... You can make a little bit of money at it. Um, that helps a lot. And getting quality queens is always a trying affair, especially if you're picky about genetics. And so, you know, it's cool to get breeding stock or get stock you like. Or if you've already got stock you like, just raise queens from what you have that is doing well for you. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So I think mastering queen rearing is a big piece of, Stevens B Company actually being what it is today. I I said before, like my third year of beekeeping, I've been relentless about trying to find or and breed for host resistance because Varroa is such a huge issue. It's a global issue. You can't run and hide from it. And I just knew that, you know, it may not be a silver bullet, but at least having bees that had an edge whenever it came to mites and diseases that that was a something I had never veered away from. I've had my eyes on that. It's like, I knew my purpose. I knew what I was supposed to do. I had a mission. It was a very difficult mission, mission, but a worthy one. And so I think just not letting go of that. And that goes back to not quitting too. Cause there's times I'm like, am I completely insane? <laughs> you know, which is a good question to ask occasionally. And uh, I, I felt felt like it was something I just wanted to keep keep after and just hang on to it like a pit bull. And I really love bees. My wife will tell you this. Like I said, she gets sick of hearing it. So I think you have to love it because, it, like I mentioned earlier, it makes sense to quit at times. You know, if you're not making a ton of money, you're putting in a ton of work. But, you know. There's nothing wrong with just having a few hives. Everybody wants to compare colony numbers. You know, like if you've got 10,000 colonies, you know, can you even enjoy them at that point? Maybe if you've got a lot of help. But, you know, I, I would say keep it to where it's actually enjoyable and you don't burn yourself out. But I really love bees. I think that's part of uh, how I was able to build a bee business and step out of a good, solid day job. And I mean, I'm saying this, I haven't stepped out of the day job yet. So hopefully, you know, everything goes well. I think it will, but it's like agriculture. You're going to have good years and bad years. Anna, do you want to field questions or do you want me to just? Yeah, I'm happy to. That was great. Thank you so much for presenting. We have some good questions in the Q&A box. And so if you want to ask questions, 
please feel free to put your questions there. Um, there was a question that came in earlier uh, about the Michigan Beekeepers Association Conference and if it was going to be in person or also have a virtual option. Um, so this year it is in person, March 1st and March 2nd, but we're doing a webinar tonight and a few other pre-conference webinars. And then there, again, there's also other beekeeping conferences around the state like Kalamazoo, Holland, Southeast Michigan Beekeepers Association. And actually, Corey, you're presenting at Southeast Michigan Beekeepers Association's meeting in person, right? Yes, I will be in Michigan here soon. Yeah. Send those Great. Meetings. Cool. So that'll be in March. Awesome. All right. Well, some good questions uh, to get us started. What is your favorite part of beekeeping and your least favorite part of beekeeping? <laughs> Uh, my favorite part is queen rearing. It's, I love doing it. It's so challenging, but I think to get good at queen rearing, you have to really be able to read bees because, you know, a lot of people say, hey, when do you start raising queens? I'm like, whenever the bees do, you know, if you start going against the bees or mother nature, you're going to start paddling upstream. So I, I would say queen rearing. My least favorite part is uh, drone semen collection is the worst. I would pay somebody a lot of money if they were really good at that. So just saying. Uh, that's, thank you. <laughs> All right. So this next question is, have you ever tried to re-inseminate a favorite failing old queen? No, I haven't. I can usually get, you know, most of them if these are still alive this year, a couple of them that we tested again this last year with UBO and Harbo, they're, they'll be three years old. So, I mean, I think that, you know, I use 10 microliters of semen, which is a industry standard wise. It's a really big dose um, because I want that longevity. I've never tried to, you know, collect out of one spermatheca or anything. I can't say I won't. That's some real B nerd stuff going on there. But no, I have not done that yet. Great. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do you do with the Harbo assay extracted brood? Um, do you I have chickens? So they're saying, do you feed it to your chickens? I tried, but they're scared of it for some reason. I think if you just sprinkled a few of them in there, and it may just because my chickens are weak. <laughs> I don't know. They're just Rhode Island red hens. They're super sweet. And they'll eat a lot of stuff, but I've if you put a box of people out there with thousands of them in there and some of them are starting to move around a little bit and stuff, like you would think they would eat it. Somebody else's may. So I don't know. I hate to say it, I waste them. I'd usually just uh, pitch them out in the garden or I'm sure the ants use them. Sure. And we'll remind people, we are not chicken experts here tonight, so <laughs> just, all right. Um, UBO is new and relatively expensive. Do you mm -hmm. foresee a price decrease in the future? Is the formula proprietary? Yeah, I'm sure the formula is proprietary. Um, you could, you would have to ask Kara that or Phoebe Snyder. That's her business partner. Their, their business is Optura. Um, you would have to ask her that. I'm assuming it's proprietary, but uh, what was the other part of that question? There was a two. Sir, do you do you foresee a price decrease in the future? Yeah, yeah, I do, because it's like anything. You know, if you're buying raw materials to make something, and you're buying smaller batches, you're paying a higher price. You know, so like they're even their test batches. What what participants agreed to pay for test batches is higher than market price because they're buying more now and they're able to scale it. So, and the price came down a fair bit. And according to Cairo, whenever they scale up, if the demand, you know, takes off, like they would really like to see it, you should see that price come down too. And I'm sure the more you buy, you know, you can get a price discount too, I'm sure once they're moving. So yeah, I, I foresee that coming down. To what? I don't know. That's a that's a Kara question. So this one, uh, feel free to answer if you feel comfortable. What percentage of your business is honey sales? Twenty five percent, maybe. Um, we are my main. The main thing that got me out of my day job 
Um, I thought it was going to be breeder queens, but for what money breeders fetch in general, um, I couldn't produce enough for it to be profitable because I only had a you know ten week window I could produce them reliably, and so it kind of bummed me out that that wasn't very profitable. Virgin queens I ship, you know, last year was the worst year I've seen. As far as honey production and in turn, you know, if your nectar pollen and pollen gets shut off, your queen production will mirror that. So normally it's a bell curve. And this was like a Walmart cart with square wheels. That's how our, our uh, nectar flow went last year. So our production was rough and we still shipped over 2000 virgin queens. Um, they're hardier to ship than queen cells or open mated queens. And so that's kind of our niche market is selling virgins. And we, we're actually, we send a lot to Michigan. And if you're interested in buying queens from us, you, you see my website here, stevensbco.com. Um, April, May, and June, I put inventory in there. Or if you're in Grand Rapids, Romulus, Fenton, Millington, Manitou Beach, Decatur, Michigan, around any of those areas, the Sustainable Beekeepers Guild um, is having like pickups of my queens on May 14th and May 21st, and also in Maumee, Ohio. So you can save on shipping, you know, if you want or interested in trying some of them. Um, hit up James or Matt and them at uh, sbgmi.org. <clears throat> if you want to try them, if not, that's no worries, but we do ship a ton to Michigan. Hey, so this, you might like this question. When do you need an extra hand? April, May, June. <laughs> and Great. if you want to pull honey, late August. As soon as the I, I'm, I procrastinate on honey production, so it depends on whenever I see the goldenrod start to swell down here. Whenever I see that, I it's like it's got to come off. All right, uh, you have mentioned non productive mites. Are these identified in the harbo in cells? Yes, non reproductives. Um, how I mentioned harbo BSH assay, you're measuring. You're quantifying the bee's ability to suppress mite reproduction. That's why they used to call them SMR bees. So what you're doing is quantifying how many out of a sample of 100, if you get it, you can get a, a, a solid score on as little as 100 if, if conditions are right. And you need a mite load, actually. But you'll pull out 100 cells and you count how many reproductive mites are in there and you tally that. And how many non-reproductives? Non-reproductives, most of you have seen a varroa mite. Um, you'll uncap that cell with a pair of fine forceps, pull it out, and actually look at the cell first. You want to look at the pupa, but don't do it. Look in the cell or else you'll lose. You'll forget which cell you pulled it out of. And you probably need a light and possibly magnification. You can get away without it if you have good eyes. But you're looking for babies. You'll see the mother mite, if it's just her, sometimes she'll poop on the pupa, poop on the pupa, and it looks like cornstarch or something white, powdery, kind of on the pupa or on the wall of the cell, and you'll just see the varroa mite female, no other mites. That's a non-reproductive, so you'll tally non-reproductive. If you pull it out and there's babies in there, which... If you, you'll see females typically that look about the same size as their mother, but they're almost translucent. They're kind of white colored. Um, and then you'll see much smaller ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those are the males and they'll be translucent too. If you see males and young males and females in there, it's a reproductive. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you'll, you'll tally a reproductive. And so in a pure VSH or pure SMRB, you know, oftentimes we'll find upwards of five non-reproductive mites in that 100 sample, zero reproductive. So it's kind of interesting to think of it, how this would correlate to an alcohol wash, because if you found five mites and 100 pupa, if those are continually emerging and you scoop up 300 of them, that would be like a 15 wash. 
So that's that kind of gives you realistic expectations about VSH. If it's 100% VSH, they allow 0% mite reproduction, but they get mites. You know, it's not, that's why I, I say an alcohol wash, I don't think is the best leading measure for breeding. You know, I think a Harbo or UBO is probably more specific. You know, that would probably be, alcohol wash would probably be third. <clears throat> but alcohol wash is great for IPM. That's what it's designed for, you know, to see when you need to intervene. If your bees are getting overrun, you know, if they hit whatever threshold you set, then it's time to clean them up. But I'm rambling here, sorry. <laughs> That that's good. We uh, we have lots of good questions here. Cool. Um, one another one is: Was there a turning point or one specific thing that made your queen rearing kind of click that made you a successful queen rearer? Yep, totally. And another talk, I think I'm going to give this one at Simba. It's entitled uh, "Cell Builders." Well, <laughs> it's entitled "Cell Builders That Don't Suck," but you can tone it down uh, to winning cell builders that win or whatever you want to call it. The difference between what make, has made me successful and I think what other people try to do is they'll read a book about queen rearing <clears throat> and they'll make a cell builder. So basically they find a colony, take the queen out or put the queen under an excluder or a cloak board or whatever and make that top box queenless. Even if you're just using using an excluder, um, the top box thinks it's queenless. I think because the queen's uh, tarsi, the glands on her tarsi, if she can't walk somewhere, they think it's queenless. Anyway, they'll start raising queens up there. So I figured that out. But the difference between, I think, me and other people oftentimes is I figured out, like, I can make an okay cell builder, but what's the missing ingredient here? Why is it? Why am I not getting top tier? I'm getting queens, but why don't they look like textbook? And the only thing I could figure out is the bees weren't in the mood. They weren't really ready to raise queens. So then I changed up my tactic. Instead of making cell builders, I would go through my yard and just crack up the box and look in there and see if they're starting to make queen cells. If they're starting to make queen cells, they are already triggered to raise queens. I don't have to convince them to do this. You know, it's just being intuitive and watching what they're wanting to do instead of just barging in there and saying, we're going to raise queens, girls. You know, and they're like, what? We're not even eating good. <laughs> There's not enough pollen coming in right now. Or, you know, the daylight hours aren't long enough, whatever triggers them. So I think what set me apart from other people was being intuitive enough to find out when the bees were already triggered and were already making queen cells. And those were my cell builders. So I would take the old queen out so I didn't lose her. You're going to have to take a frame out for your grafting frame anyway. And I would move her into a retirement home or a little five frame nuke. I would give her like a frame of brood and a frame of honey. And a lot of times they'll grow into 10 frames or more, you know, throughout the season. Then you have her the next year if you want her. And then I would take the queen cells out that they had already made. And so, you know, there's three reasons or stimuli, if you will, of why bees will raise queens. Number one, swarming. That's when they want to raise queens. That's nature's ideal way. Two, supersedure. Something's wrong with the queen. We're going to raise one or two queens and keep one extra. That's hard to reproduce. People think that they are but they're actually, it's a queenless environment. If you look closely, they're emergency cells. You know, with supersedure cells, they actually have a cup constructed. They don't make it out of a worker cell. And then emergency. So whenever I take the queen out, I'm using emergency. This one's hard to recreate, so it's out. And they're already wanting to swarm. So basically, we both <laughs> looked at our criteria. Yep, 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 time to raise queens. And that's how I get the highest quality queens because I'm obsessive over quality. And also, if you look at a lot of those grafting frames, there's three room for three bars on it. Don't use three. You know, is that swarmy colony going to raise 60 queen cells? Probably not, even if they're big. Just put one or two bars in there, like 20 or 40, and you'll get way nicer 
more well-fed cells. So go for quality first and then you can scale, you know, if you're wanting quantity, but don't, don't skimp on quality. Great. Thank you. All right. If I wanted to do some small scale queen rearing, so two to three queen, sorry, two to three queen mother hives, how many drone producer colonies would you recommend in a mating yard for open mating? Um, it depends on how many queens you're producing out of those. You know, you said three colonies. If you have three cell builders, I mean, over the course of three weeks, if I have a solid double deep colony that I use as a cell builder, on average, I'll get around 100 queens out of it. So, you know, what are you talking about? Are you talking about raising 10 queens out of each one or over the course of three weeks, you know, potentially 300 queens out of those three colonies? If it's 300 queens you know, you're going to want substantially more. And I don't know what math, um, you know, how many colonies. I would say the first thing you would need to pay attention to rather than colony math are, are you just seeing purple-eyed drones or is there tons of drones in there? You know, is this the really, really early season or is it peak season? So I know that kind of answers a question with a question, but I don't know. I don't, I've never really had a, uh, I've never done colony drone drone mother math, so to speak. I just try to wait until there's a large population of them, because even if you've got, you know, 10 or 15 colonies, that's quite a few drones. And you may have neighbor colonies or or feral colonies as well. So I would have to say I don't know exactly. You know, if you're mating hundreds of queens, I would want a lot of colonies around um, just because. I don't like to cut corners. You know, I would want those girls to meet up with as many drones as they wanted to. So I'm sorry, I don't really have an exact answer on that. But, you know, annoyingly, I would answer with it depends. <laughs> it's always the right answer in beekeeping. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, what negative selection techniques do you use in your breeding system? What do you mean by negative? So that's, that's the question. I'm guessing they're thinking like absence of certain traits in order to select mm. for, or maybe the, a question we could just ask you is what, what do you use for your selection criteria? Okay. That's a good one. I like that. So first and foremost, I let, I manage bees like a normal beekeeper would. I don't use any odd, um, equipment configurations, you know, I'm using standard Langstroth equipment. I may, I aggressively requeen, I raise from good stock, and then I pretty much let mother nature um, have her way with them to try to reveal some weakness. So I would say one of my major selection criteria is just how can they handle it in reality without me constantly uh, blowing their nose and wiping their butt. Um, if there's anything that doesn't look right, again, I aggressively requeen. And after they've gone through a calendar year and they look good, they're workable, they're strong colonies, like they're a little bitty colony that never grew, I wouldn't worry with testing those. So that's the whole calendar year. They need to be productive um, in a commercial operation, ideally. And I, and I have friends that run my stock in commercial settings. Um, one in particular has mailed, you know, the highest performing F1 queens back to me after they came out of almonds. And so I'll be expanding that program um, just so they have more of a select commercial selection pressure on them as well. And actually the last hurdle that I use after all of that mother nature, commercial selection and certain environments is host resistance and you know, before I couldn't test it, I could only could just pick the ones that looked good. Like if they start to look ratty or I had to requeen them or they were a cull, they were marked cull, you know, I would take them out of the breeding program, but I couldn't measure anything until Harbo taught the VSH assay. So since spring of 20, my breeding stock has had intense um, SMR assay selection done on it. And we just started using UBO. You know, we trialed it last June. And so my plan is to UBO any potential breeding stock in the spring 
because I, you need a mite load, like I mentioned. If you treat your bees in the fall, you could jack with your scores, SMR scores in the spring. So I think UBO has an advantage in the spring where it doesn't fight your IPM program. So if you clean your bees up in the fall, you could UBO test them in the spring, which is what I'm planning to do. And then whenever your mite levels start to rise late August or August, whenever this year, you now the pictures of Matt and James and Megan, that was like the first week of September. So that I'm getting to where I'm at, you know, ideally closer to peak levels of mites in my colonies so that I get easy um, mite scores. So I would say that's, the long version of my selection criteria, you know, the last hurdle is, is VSH or UBO, but they need to be productive too. <laughs> Excuse me. Hey, thanks. Well, we do have lots of questions still. So um, I don't know if you want to stay here tonight, tomorrow night, you know, next few weeks. Um, oh, we I'm good for a little while longer if you'd like, or if you need to call it, um, you can call it, but I'm good for some more questions. If you want to keep throwing them, I'll keep. All right. I'll keep that, that sounds great. Thanks for answering so many. And people are asking really good questions. Yeah, they've so, been really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what is the lifespan of your instrumentally inseminated queens? Um, the ones that function normally, you know, there's a, a small percentage that get rejected or they'll have, uh, uh, this sometimes isn't a small percentage, you know, um, it could be upwards of 30 or 40%. I'll have something wrong, like plugged oviducts or something. Whenever you introduce them, the ones that are introduced properly, a few of them, will want to supersede, but if they function like a normal queen, which the majority of them should, or at least half, I think is, is what a reasonable expectation. Those should act just like a regular queen and really um, 18 months, I think is what a, a study that Sue Kobe cited that's been several years ago. So it may have, there may be updated data, but about 18 months, you know, like I said, I've got a couple out there that are three years old, but on average, I would say 18 months, about like a queen. Great. Thank you. Um, th this is another good question. Any tips for record keeping for queen rearing? I have trouble keeping track of different traits from different queens. Yeah, um, there's there's two ways to look at this. And I think the first thing would be to say some data is oftentimes better than mass amounts of data because I think some people um, with the best of intentions try to collect six, eight, da 10 data sets on all these individual colonies. And I feel like you get uh, paralysis by analysis, so to speak. Like you have so much data, it's like, well, that one's good at this, but it's terrible at that. And I think uh, don't risk trying to keep too much data. I think you need to have some wiggle room or I don't know what you would call it, allowance for um, skilled bee beekeepers that they're like, that's a good colony. You know, like that's all you need to know. They're, they're disease free, they're workable, they're big, they're productive, you know? So I think you would only want to test those, but um, I would caution not over collecting data. And, you know, like if you write simple stuff on the lid, you know, use a paint marker, don't use a Sharpie because the sun will fade out a Sharpie, you know, and you could use your phone. It'll be covered with propolis or you could just have a, a paper log, which works pretty well. But I would say uh, keep en just enough data that you'll actually write it and it's not too cumbersome. Um, the more data, the better, but just don't take so much to where you just lose effectiveness. It's a balance. Thank you. Do you have other beekeepers in your neighboring area? And if so, are they on the same page regarding genetics? I've got just a couple. I'm in a extremely rural area and the honey production is not great here. So like no one has a reason to be out here. <laughs> Really, you're not here to make honey, I'm sure. I mean, you'll make a little bit, but if you, there's other areas that are far better for honey production. So no, I don't have a ton. Most of them are hobbyists. There's a lot of 
even whenever I came here, there were feral bees. Whenever I was scouting this, the property that my house is on here is a little less than 30 acres. And whenever I was thinking about buying it, it was early spring and I'm kind of a wildlife biologist at heart. So I was just scouting the place and I was in the ditches and just looking around wildlife sign and hen bit and dead nettle were blooming. And there was a surprising amount of honeybees on it. And they, a lot of them were a darker colored bee. So, I mean, there's always been a type of feral bee, I think around here, so to speak, but yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. No, it's it's good to know a little bit about your area for context of what kind of operation you're running. The short version is there's a few hobbyists and they oftentimes get queens from me. So that's a lot shorter version. I'm sure. All right. So this question's a little bit long, but I think it's it's a good one. I have raised queens in the past and loved it, but it seemed like a lot of people who wanted to buy queens were calling for an emergency replacement queen and didn't even really know how to properly introduce a new one. It killed me to know that half of my beautiful, well-mated and good laying queens were being killed by inexperience. So it's been an hour teaching how to properly introduce a new queen. After a while, it didn't seem like the money I was making was worth the time. I guess I'm pretty jaded about that. The people out there killing my queens. How do you get over that? Um, I don't think you should get over it, honestly, because you put a lot of hard work into that. And I mentioned earlier that I sell virgin queens only. And that's because I, it sounded like I was talking to myself here in that question uh, several years back. And I was charging, I thought I was getting really good money for them, but I was charging $30 a piece, you know? Um, same thing was happening. A lot of them are getting murdered or you put in a colony that wasn't even actually queenless and just everything. Um, so yeah, I don't think you should get over that. Really. I wouldn't advise it. I think you should look at other avenues like maybe virgin queens. If you're really good at queen rearing <clears throat> and you can produce high quality queens, look at queen cells and then you don't wait three or four weeks for this beautiful queen to start laying this awesome brood pattern where you want to keep her and then send her off for, you know, I don't know what you're getting out of them. Even if it's 50 bucks, you know, maybe it's worth it. I don't know. For what nucleus colonies are going for, this is another reason I don't sell open mated queens. Um, whenever I was selling those open mated Queens, I was selling them for $30 a piece. Nucleus colonies were 175 or 180 So I, I've only got like a 10-week, maybe 12-week season if I'm allowing a minimum of three to four weeks for these queens to lay because I would let them really lay to where I could see the pattern before I would sell them. I've got three rounds. So I can get three, six, I can get $90 working for 12 weeks hard or... I could get twice that for making up a nuke and then just selling the nuke. So maybe that's not what you want to hear, but I would say don't get over it. Um, I don't think it's worth it to sell open mated queens. It's like selling the heart out of the watermelon for cheap. I think you should sell queen uh, cells, virgins, or nukes, if that's an acceptable answer. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do you do for varroa treatment? I don't do anything. And some people get agitated at me for saying that. So I always put a disclaimer behind it that I'm an entomologist. If you're practicing integrated pest management, you know, you should clean up your bees. But because I was solely looking at host resistance, whenever I would treat them, I would never know if it was actually the bees that had any measurable resistance or if it was the acaricides or antibiotics I put on it. So, you know, I think it's responsible to keep up with your bees and use IPM and address problems where needed. But I was able to build a sustainable business um, without using them for the last 12 years. But at the risk of leading the youth astray, that's always my fear. Um, I don't use any. Why do you prefer cypress wood for your hives? I'd always heard, maybe it was the old wives' tale, but how long cypress wood lasts, 
Um, and I like to go overboard whenever I do things. And so I would buy cypress wood and then I would hot wax dip it too after I hot branded. And I have to say, there's, I'm going to be dead and gone and there's going to be some Stevens V company Cypress branded boxes floating around. They might look rough, but they won't, some of them won't be rotted out yet. Um, it's just a personal preference of mine. I think I like the, um, the weight and density of the wood. I think it's pretty durable and it just weathers exceptionally well. Great. Thanks. Does Zach Lamas's recent comments on focusing on varroa mite load testing with drones have any impact on your queen breeding and assay testing? Um, it left me with more questions. Um, the main thing I would say is like if you read protocol for a Harbo VSH assay, it's always done exclusively in the worker brood. Um, and I don't know why that is, if it's just for standardization, probably. Um, I don't know, but I've also heard some people say that VSHBs don't work drone brood, which is not true, at least not in my population. Um, they uncap and remove a significant amount of drone brood, um, just like worker brood. So I don't think that's true. Maybe it's the case in some lines of bees, but not in mine. Um, and it's easy to see that oftentimes, um, remember that drone catching image that I showed that had the entrance includer on the front of it. Well, I'll have them on there for 10 or 15 minutes a lot of times and I'll look and I have a picture of this in one of my presentations. If there's two drone purple eyed drone pupa stuck in that excluder because you know they're just continually checking them out and if they're infested or sick they're throwing them outside. And in the 10 minutes I had that includer on there was already two pupa stuck in there. So, yeah, I, like I said, it just leaves me with more questions because, you know, we know we're, Varroa are more attracted to drone brood. So could you do 50 or 25 drone brood instead of doing 100 worker brood? You know, those questions arise and have arisen with some people that have helped me test. I don't have enough data to say yay or nay or I have no idea. So. I don't know. Hopefully I have more data in the next couple of years. Maybe we could make a correlation, but I haven't been able to do that yet. So I would stick with the, the gold standard for now. Sounds All right. Thanks. So we have a lot of questions left in the Q&A. I don't know if you want to open it up and maybe scroll through and pick a few that sure. uh, you want to end the night with. Sounds great. Let me see here. I'll stop share. <clears throat> All right. One of them, I don't think we've covered this one. Do you have a specific mating yards? And was there a time when you were trying to get some local feral genetics into your operation? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, whenever I first started, um, I didn't requeen colonies that didn't have a problem. And I saw a lot of feral colonies that I don't think, some of them, I don't think it was VSH, but they were just extremely rugged. And even if they got a mite load, you wouldn't see viral issues or brood pattern issues. And every season they would make a, a, a honey crop. So typically if they got a decent load like that, where it was noticeable, I wouldn't graft out of them, but they're cranking out drones all year round. You know, and a lot of my queens I'm open mating. So uh, I did work some feral genetics in, but I pressed pretty hard because some of the or a fair amount of the feral ge genetics I caught weren't exactly what I was after. So there is some in my, and, you know, I may explore that more in the future, but now that I'll have a little bit more time. Mm. For, Corey, for us hobbyists, would you recommend requeening on hive issues quickly? Um, if so, would maintaining queens and nukes on a regular basis be the best way to approach keeping VSH in our hobby hives? Um, absolutely. Especially if you've got somebody who's actually selecting, um, you know, unless they're in South Florida, there's a just a strict time window. So you kind of have to get it while they're there and maybe you don't need a queen yet. But if you start those reserve nukes in the background and queen those with virgins or cells and you get them mated and they're rocking and rolling, 
that is the absolute best way to fix a problem. So it depends on, you know, questions. Would you recommend requeening on hive issues quickly? It depends on what's the issue. Are they hungry? You know, I wouldn't requeen. Um, do they have severe mite issues? You know, uh, obvious viral issues, chalk brood, anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. I would requeen it. <clears throat> and it's far easier to requeen a colony with a nuke. Um, it's like a steroid shot and a, re a genetics change. So if you have one that's sketchy, um, you can just combine that, put that nuke, that five frame or whatever you have right in the center. And I would cage that queen. And, um, you know, instead of newspaper and all that stuff, it's a bit more risky. Get rid of your old queen. Um, cage your your VSH queen and your nuke and just put them together and then you know within three days or so you can turn her loose and I almost guarantee you that's the highest success of a requeening period is to use a queen with all of her own brood um, to requeen so yeah absolutely nukes love that idea requeening with nukes and, and keeping VSH traits in the rear yep that's a good really good approach so um, can you raise queens that could be universally used throughout the U.S. and even the world or do geographic factors and other conditions have an impact on ultimate success? There's a lot in that question. Uh, for, <clears throat> here's, a, here's the most direct way I think I would answer that question. If you have a bee that is truly mite resistant, and they won't eat themselves out of house and home, so they kind of dial back the brood whenever the resources shut off, so they won't starve to death quite as easily, and they're not getting completely destroyed by Varroa. I think wherever you put them, they're going to have an advantage. But I also think there's advantages. You know, to what degree does the scientific literature say this? I don't know. I know there's a lot of debate on it, but I do think that certain... Uh, genetic variations in certain areas are more acclimated to that, you know, like a desert type small bee, you know, that has certain forage preferences. I would say, you know, they may outdo uh, an import, but are they going to get chewed up by mites? You know, there's a lot of factors. Um, and ideally, that's one cool thing about virgins. If you if you bring virgins in whenever that brood nest is established, it's half whatever bees you have in your area, hopefully in theory that do well, with a strong emphasis on host resistance. And if that is an F1 that came out of one of my breeders, um, all the drones that she makes for her entire life um, should be VSH or a resistant drone because they don't have a father, only a grandfather. That's a great question. R is supersedured earlier than natural mated. I wouldn't say if I'm if I'm interpreting this correctly, Alex. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, he, he's comparing instrumentally inseminated queens to open mated queens. Are they supersedured? Do they have more supersedure? Um, they can. Yeah, sometimes they have issues with them. It, sometimes it's just a batch or I don't know, you know, like I don't know if it's the queens or if you introduced an issue when you did insemination, but sometimes, you know, you'll have uh, you'll have occasionally have some that supersede. But I've seen mated queens, although they could have been damaged in shipping, that superseded at rates that I don't see instrumentally inseminated queens superseded. So there's a lot of factors there. How good's the inseminator? How good were the queens the inseminated? And what are you comparing it to? You know, if it's open mated, did it get shipped? You know, did UPS bake that thing in a brown truck? You know, there's a lot of uh, variables that come into play there. Have you achieved permanent resistance to mites? Um, I don't know exactly. As far as like, is that staying in my population at extremely high measurable levels? Yes. But do VSHBs get mites? Yes. Do VSHBs die from starvation or nosema or who knows what else that bees could get? Yes, they do. You know, they're not immortal. 
Um, but I would say, yeah, I have achieved very high um, levels of res measurable resistance that has stayed in the generations. But, you know, like what would that do in an open mated operation? I don't know. If you don't test, you know, it could go away or could dilute. But if you actually keep testing, you know, there's a lot of evidence, especially with hygiene in general, that as long as you're testing and keeping that selection pressure on it, you know, in theory, you could keep it really high. Speaking of which, this was Marla Spivak. That's some of the research I was just talking about loosely there. Did I meet Marla at the B Expo? I did not. I've met Marla before. Brilliant scientist. What do you think about her ongoing work with hygienic bees? I mean, I love it. She's, she's part of the reason, um, I believe, that John Harbo changed SMR, suppressed mite reproduction, to VSH because she, I don't know how this happened, if they were talking or pushing back on each other, but somehow they decided it was like a hygienic type or a hygienic trait um, that they were targeting reproductive mites or sick mites. So, yeah, I think uh, her ongoing work with hy hygienic bees is awesome. It's had a big influence on what I'm doing. Um, do you do both Harbo and UBO when selecting which queens to breed from or just the Harbo? Previously, it was just the Harbo. We only, we've only done one round of UBO testing. That was in June. So next spring, I'm going to be using uh, UBO, but I am going to Harbo test some queens because um, the more we know, the more we find out we don't know. And it was weird because some of my bees, um, we had an enormous percentage of our population that was extremely high scoring on UBO, but some of the population that scored low on UBO was a four on an SMR scale. This allowed 0% mite reproduction. So what the, what the heck is that all about? So that's a separate research project I'm working on is breeding a high SMR, low UBO line to compare them so that we kind of understand what's going on here better. But yeah, I plan to do both, mainly UBO in the spring and Harbo in the fall on all the stuff I want to test, but for that project, I'll be doing a uh, Harbo test too in the spring. What was the tipping point that made you quit my day job? Well, that's complicated too. Um, I think it was that I knew what I could make on a bad year in my spare time. Um, I'm, I basically, what I grossed with the bees surpassed, you know, my salary with my day job. And now that's gross. That's not what you get to spend. But I think that woke me up like, okay. And I, I'm an ADD kid. I love to be in nature and I like problem solving and I like lots of variables, which is beekeeping is why we're insane for doing it. But I love that. Um, I think it's that and uh, re debt reduction, you know, to where um, if I have a bad year because it's agriculture, I won't immediately hang myself because it's not just me. Um, I'm married, been married almost 20 years. I got an 18 year old that's getting ready to launch and a 17 year old right behind her. So I think it was knowing what I could do on a bad year. Like I said, we shipped over 2000 virgins last year and debt reduction and me getting tired of sitting at a desk that had a big impact on it you mentioned your honey production was down last year can you speculate causes for that weather drought bees um, again multiple factors here weather had a big effect on it um, some major nectar sources even though the weather wasn't terrible like blackberry just failed i don't know if it was because of the weather or what but it just didn't hit like it normally does um also, I knew whenever Kara was coming to test that she was like five months pregnant, <laughs> Dr. Kara. And so I was like, oh my gosh, it's like 90 degrees and she's coming down here to test. And I didn't want to be running all over the place. And so I emptied out a couple yards of bees and really stacked them too heavy in my yard, probably overpopulated it a bit. And so that compounded it and made it worse. But it was super easy to test. And so, you know, there's always a trade-off. I don't think it was the bees. Um, 
How do I involve my kids? What jobs do I give them? Before they were just professional queen handlers. They didn't realize it, but we go through thousands of queen cells every year and cage the virgins as they emerge. And so my kids, since a young age, they don't even think it's cool because it's just something they have to do or think they have to do. Um, they've caged thousands and thousands and thousands of queen bees that have just emerged. So um, they're professionals at that. Jade started making lip balms and stuff. She's starting to use wax. She's kind of got her own little sister company going, Moon Glow Alchemy, she named it. Um, and she made my business card, so she's way better at marketing than I ever thought about being. And just general help, like feeding bees. Um, they're involved more than they want to be at times. Um, do you feel your bees will work with, well fielding tropolalets? I don't know. I can only speculate. Here's here My speculations are favorable, though, and here's why. Um, so VSHBs or UBOBs respond to stress pheromones or unhealthy brood odor. Well, Varroa, this is kind of based loosely on some Sammy Ramsey uh, data. So uh, Varroa will feed, a Varroa foundress, a female, will feed at one site, so she'll just bite once, from what I understand, and feed there. Well, Tropolalops, according to Sammy, bite all over the place. So this is just... Uh, my mind thinking about this, so I could be off base, but I would feel like if you bite continuously all over the place, that's really going to agitate that uh, unhealthy brood odor. I think it would stimulate it. So I think that um, that may be a downfall of tropolalips is just that they bite them and parasitize too much, and hopefully the SHBs have their number and throw them out. That's totally speculation. There's no there's no data to back that up. So take that with a grain of salt. Has anyone done studies to determine what causes some mites to be non-reproductive? Is it related to their age? It could be related to their age. I don't know, but I think Harbo says in that in, that, uh, in his assay. And if you want to look it up, Google Harbo B Company. Um, click on VSH, and I think there's a Measure VSH tab, and you can read. The whole thing, score charts, everything. You can get it from the horse's mouth. So, no, he, I didn't ever determine him to say that. The only thing I remember is just that they said, like, on average, approximately 16% just can't reproduce um, in nature. It's just, you know, for whatever reason, you know, people or any living organism, there's always a percentage that are infertile for whatever reason. But I don't know. I don't know if it's related to their age. But they do know if it's over 16%, 25, 30, 50, 75, 100% suppressed mite reproduction, that's not the mite. That's your VSHBs doing what they do. Do I have problems with swarming? No, I love swarming. I actually don't add enough supers to kind of make them want to swarm. Because... <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, that's what's different between my cell builders and a lot of people. My bees actually want to raise queens. <laughs> that's the difference. Um, and so I, I don't try to hinder it. But I don't lose a ton of swarms unless I just didn't get to a colony for one reason or another. You know, had too much going on with family stuff. Because, like I mentioned earlier, if I have a double deep, large double deep colony, I can easily get about 100 queens out of it. I sell those for $25 a piece. So if you're good at math, um, that's what I see every time a swarm leaves my yard, $2,500. Let's, let's do one more question. You've been really generous with your time. One more question. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna let me scan a couple here. I got to pick a good one. Um. The Harbo assay is done on worker bees, right? This is Tina Sebastian. I think she's from Colorado. The Harbo assay is done on worker bees, right? Would the number scoring be different using drone brood? I don't know. But I love that question because uh, I, the only way I could answer it is more data is needed. Like I'll need to do a bunch of drone assays on the same colony as worker assays and overlap that information to where I can have a lot bigger data set to see if there's like a, a definite correlation. If we could use a smaller sample size, which would be awesome. That's the downside of the Harbo assay, really. It's it's time consuming. And UBO is a bit more expensive, but I think it's like 
three times as fast. So anyway, I really enjoyed this and I'm greatly appreciate the invite, Anna. I've enjoyed emailing you and Thank uh, you. I'm glad to meet you. Thank you so much. We really appreciated your presentation and taking the time to answer so many questions. Uh, thanks to the Michigan Beekeepers Association for co-hosting this webinar. And we'll see you in Michigan in March for the Southeastern Michigan Beekeepers Association Conference. Uh, but before that, um, come to the Michigan Beekeepers Association Conference, March 1st and March 2nd. So lots of upcoming events, but thanks a lot, Corey, and thanks to everyone who joined. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.